So, well, hey, everybody, thank you so much for coming, and thank you to Annie Olson and Katie Weldens for joining us this evening uh, for our 2019 candidate forum. Um, as you know, we've got an election coming up April 3rd, and uh, we just wanted to take a chance to, uh, get a chance, I should say, to meet the candidates. Um, we do have some prepared questions that we gave each candidate uh, to prepare and to think about, so we'll start with those. And thank you to Jewel Geisler for moderating tonight and you know, keeping us moving forward. I really appreciate that. And uh, as you'll notice, we do have a quorum of board members here this evening. Um, it has been posted and no official business will be occurring um, as we move forward this evening. So a um, couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we do have some uh, questions if, or uh, some papers if you'd like to write down any questions. Um, once you just write them down, if you want to raise your hand, one of us, or Mary can come and get them, and uh, give them to Jewel, and away we go. We do have uh, prepared questions as well, if we don't have audience questions, so we'll just make sure we keep things going. Um, our goal is to wrap things up from questions right around 8.05, and then uh, closing statements and things like that, so hopefully we'll wrap up by 8.15 this evening. So, um, my role, before I turn it over to Jewel, will be the timekeeper. And I'll just be standing up here, just kind of making sure that uh, we uh, stick to the time allotment that uh, we've been given. So, Jewel, we'll turn it over to you, and uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, so I'd like to thank the uh, PTO for sponsoring this again. It's uh, awesome that they do this, so uh, we as a community can uh, meet our potential new board member. So, uh, we're going to switch off. Uh, Katie, Andy, Andy, Katie, on every question. Uh, so the first question is yours, Andy. Uh, in your view, I know who to open the stage. Oh, yeah, yeah opening the stage. There. there we go. <laughs> I was jumping right into it. All right, so Katie, you're uh, you're ready for opening statements. Yeah, first. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Katie Wilkins. My husband and I, Andy, have lived here for 10 years. We've been married for 15. We have three children in the district. Jack, our oldest, is 11, and he's in fifth grade. Ben um, is in fourth grade, he's 10. Megan, our youngest, is seven and she's in second grade. Um, I'm active volunteer in school. I also am coach to all of the kids in soccer. I currently am Megan's soccer coach. We are members at um, St. Charles Parish in Heartland. Um, in addition to that, I have been on the school board for the last three years. And my current role is school board treasurer. And so I'm just really thrilled and excited to be here. Andy? My name is Andy Olson. I also have three kids. Uh, my wife Erica and I just moved here a year ago. And uh, we love it so far. We have three kids. The oldest is in 4K. And then we have a two-year-old and a one-year-old. All very excited to go through this district. Um, we are members at St. Joan of Arc in Minnesota. And career-wise, I'm a director of strategy at an outsourced IT firm. Uh, so we do IT for small companies. And I'm basically a virtual CIO uh, for about 60 different companies in the Milwaukee area. Uh, so with that, I'm very uh, business-minded and not on the teaching side of things, but more business-minded. And I look at the school board as kind of like the business side of the, of the school. Uh, so that's why I think I get a good fit. Um, I'm very family-oriented. My family always comes first. We chose to move here specifically for the school district, uh, the small hometown feel, and uh, to basically set down roots and uh, kind of learn more and get more involved in the community. I, I volunteer in the community at the uh, Merton Fire Department, uh, which I started there pretty much almost a year ago as well, and uh, having fun with that as well. Thanks, All right, now the first question. Uh, this is for Andy. In your view, what are some of the major issues present presently facing the district? With that, what are your positions on those issues and or what would you recommend the district do differently, continue approaching the same, or how you recommend we should confront those issues? The four issues, uh, or I guess the main issue and the most obvious probably is the finances. The, the dwindling budgets, uh, but yet you're expected to do more with less kind of thing. Uh, in my day-to-day, -day, I'm constantly creating budgets, uh, finding inefficiencies in the, in the business, and finding areas where we can uh, expand and make things more efficient. Uh, we can 
uh, do, you know, take a little bit from here, put it over here, and we can uh, make things a lot better. Uh, it's, you're expected to keep the, you know, small hometown, small class sizes, uh, but yet, you know, you've got less money to do so. Uh, it's a hard thing to, how to fix or how to keep doing. Uh, I don't have any complaints with the current, strat the current strategies. Uh, the way I would try and keep doing it would be to research and make sure that things are running as smooth as possible. Uh, the second major issue, I think, is security. And uh, basically with all the you know, terrible things in the news that you see, and I think schools are doing a great job uh, about doing drills, um, we've got physical barriers, uh, as well as you know, the trainings and the, the drills uh, going on in schools. Uh, I think that you also need to keep that learning environment. You don't want it to feel like the kids are in you know, this lockdown area. You gotta make sure that they know that they can still be still be kids. Uh, the third thing would be technology. I think it's important that the teachers uh, so they see past the hype and they don't want just the newest and greatest things. They, they uh, are specifically given the tools that will actually help them succeed in teaching the children. Uh, and then the fourth thing I think is the, the mindsets of the students and the teachers. Uh, right now, there's you know, all this hype, everyone's got all this pressure on them, everyone's so busy, everyone's got this pressure to achieve, the pressure of social media, the trying to fit in, and what can we do? And I think the only way to fix that would be uh, just keep, keep open lines of communication and um, just keep the psychologists and the counselors open for time for the kids want it. Okay. Um, the four, I, well, I feel actually, I, I wouldn't even call them major issues. I think we've got some great opportunities because we're a really, really high achieving um, district with phenomenal educators and great families. My one area for opportunity with the retirement of Mr. Budish is how do we facilitate so the retirement of Mr. Budish and additionally having to hire um, a K-3 literacy coach, how do we facilitate and make sure that's a smooth transition while being mindful of the students and the families and the staff. Second, I think we have great opportunity to continue to support staff development and to continue to improve and work on climate and culture relative to staff and be really mindful and aware of that. Um, third, I see great opportunity to continue to grow um, our inclusionary practices and continue to drill in on uh, individualizing learning. We have um, an SEL adoption coming up, so social emotional learning, I think that adoption next year is going to give us great opportunity to bring those inclusionary practices to all the classrooms. Um, last, from a technology standpoint, I think we need to continue to look for efficiencies and unique ways to utilize the technology we have. I would also propose um, that right now, from grades third on, from a technology standpoint, we're a one-to-one -one device to student. I think first and second grade should also be one-to-one, -one, given some of the curriculum adoptions we've made. I think that makes a lot of sense. It also um, gives opportunity to give the teacher and the student some cases for differentiation. So those are three, or excuse me, four areas of opportunity I think we could really examine. Thanks. All right, question number two, uh, Katie, you're first on this one. Okay. How do you see your professional or personal experiences impacting the district as a school board member, and what opportunities exist for you to make the greatest impact? Okay. Well, when I started on the school board three years ago, um, it was the first board I'd ever served on, so there's definitely a, a learning curve when I dove into the opportunity and um, took advantage of some of the resources that were available and started with um, various CISA workshops and also went to WASB Summer Leadership Institute and then attended um, some discussion groups and talks on educational equality and its economic input to just get kind of a foundation and look at like what is the true function of a school board. So now having that knowledge, that foundation, and that experience, I've also been um, part of a strategic plan that we did last year 
And the strategic plan um, was a bunch of community members, staff members, board members, and we came up with the mission statement and our vision and values, but also from that came four separate com committees. And the committee that I chose to be part of was the Workforce Engagement and Development Committee. And through that work with um, Jewel, we looked at survey, re a survey had been given to all the staff and we identified areas um, of opportunity where climate, culture, and morale needed to be addressed and there was definitely room for growth. So we were charged as a committee to try to figure out how to fix this or how to grow it, but we needed to go way back. And we took the time and we met with every single staff member to start from a lens that was truly theirs and get authentic feedback from them as opposed to sitting here saying, hey, we've got the answer to fix your problems. Um, given that, we met with everybody. We've had large group meetings. We're moving in the right direction, but there's definitely still areas of opportunity and it's a committee that needs to continue to stay mindful on the task of growing culture. Um, and so that's something where I see, as the question was asked, my personal experience, that I can take that personal experience from the last few years and continue to grow that in the right direction for the district. Okay, same question. Are we good for it? Uh, okay. Uh, the best thing I can do is relate it to my professional experience. Uh, with these small businesses, I'm strategically finding these inefficiencies and looking for areas of, of improvement. Uh, that can be anything from technology to, let's well, typically technology, but it might be even just a workflow, workflow issue. Uh, so also with my uh, career, I'm, I'm constantly project managing, uh, projects being you know, new software, new products, whatever is going on. Uh, so then I have to make sure that I'm st held to these strict deadlines and uh, make sure that the projects finish on time and are successful. Um, then going back to the budgets, I know it's money's uh, always a always a topic with with school boards, so uh, it's my day to day stuff. Thanks. All right, question number three, and this is uh, this is for Andy first. Uh, with schools across the state being hit with decreased state aid and budgets being tightened, how do you go about deciding what to keep doing, stop doing, or look to expand? What are some of the those ideas, programs, or areas the district should continue to keep doing, stop doing, or look to expand them? I really like all the uh, the things that the district is currently doing. The main issue I would do, or main thing I would do, is look for feedback from the community. I would, uh, from the parents, make sure that they're happy with everything that's going on. Uh, the school does an awesome job of communicating with the parents. Um, which is awesome, uh, but we'd also want to make sure that the district keeps the competitive advantage for rated very high in the state, so we want to make sure that we keep that and keep uh, on the edge of things and don't fall behind the times. Uh, on the financial side of things, I would look to explore additional avenues for uh, funding, uh, look for more grants, uh, and just look for areas for savings to then take that and put, put elsewhere. Uh, we want to make sure that everything's backed up by facts and not by uh, hearsay and uh, everything is, you know, got a source. Um, and then also review test scores. So let's say, you know, if uh, math's doing bad, we want to find some money somewhere else and in increase the, the math funding kind of thing is what the other thing I, idea that I would do. Cool, thanks. Okay, you want me to read the question again or are you good? I've got it. Thanks, Deborah. Um, one of the things that we did last year and working as a board um, and as the individual committees that we have, we're constantly looking for efficiencies or ways to improve things or ways to grow student experiences or opportunity. Um, and last year, as a member of the Student Achievement Committee, we realized that there was a duplication in 5-6 music curriculum, that there was a requirement for the students to take general music and also pick um, choir and or band. And we didn't feel that it was necessarily to the best advantage for the students to have to have that many minutes specified to music. And DPI requires us only to require music K through six. So requiring a band or choir elective met that requirement. 
Um, and also in addition, by reworking the schedule, gave us 10 extra minutes to tack on to choir and um, band, which then, I don't know how many of you were at the Christmas concert, but Mr. Jupp made a point of saying, because of the 10 additional minutes that band was able to get every day in their classes, the fifth graders for the first time ever were able to put on a true fifth, day, fifth grade holiday concert, not just like the really rudimentary, we're still learning the basics of um, music. So I thought it was really cool to see such a great positive side effect from that being recognized. Um, what, what I said earlier, also being on the TILT committee, which is the technology and learning and meeting with the staff um, monthly for now the last two years um, and identifying teacher and student standards relative to technology. I think it would be important, again, to invest in one-to-one um, -one devices for first and second grade. Cool. Thanks. We have one audience question. So this is on professional development and uh, Speak for UK first. Okay. So, what are your thoughts about professional development for the superintendent and principal roles? Do you support it? What do you think you should focus on? I 100% um, support it. I think everybody, just human being across the board, <laughs> has got room to grow and needs development and needs opportunity and needs um, mentors in particular. I support. Curriculum is ever evolving, um, so when we have principals in rooms evaluating staff and educators, in order for them to be able to give them the best feedback, their experience needs to be evolving too, and they need to be learning the curriculum. I feel the same way with the superintendent. It needs to remain up to date on curriculum, and we need to focus also on skills that aren't just academic, but are, um, from an administrative standpoint, are we also meeting soft skills? And if we identify areas of need or opportunity there, those need to be addressed as well. Okay, same question, uh, I think I remember it. Uh, I definitely support it. Uh, I myself am always looking to learn. I enjoy going to learn things, and I think that's important. I think it's important that, uh, especially that in an administrative role, that you're constantly learning uh, new protocols, new ideas that are out there. Uh, usually when people get to those development groups, they they all collaborate, and it comes to a greater good, even more than what you went to learn in that uh, for that event. So I think it's important that uh, the superintendent and the principal participate in those type of events. Uh, it would also just make sure that then they could filter down these you know ideas and introduce new ideas, because uh, collaboration is really key. Any other good questions from the audience? All right. So uh, with all the talk on school safety, what are your thoughts on how to keep our schools as safe as possible? And this is for you, Andy, first. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think doing the drills are, are important. Uh, it's unfortunate that it's kind of come to that, but it's, it is what it is in this day and age. Uh, I know in the schools we have physical barriers and I'm sure those will be increasing as time goes on. Uh, but I think the drills are important, so that way, should something happen, it's uh, not necessarily a, everyone's got their tasks and they know exactly what to do. Um, with that, I think also that psychology and the counseling uh, are important for the kids they have access to, which they have awesome access to. Um, we just want to continue that. Uh, and then also, I think security is a, like I'm focusing on the, the barriers and the kind of threats and things, but also it's technology. You know, online, uh, we've got social media, we've got kids bullying other kids, and unfortunately there's no easy way to keep that from happening, but, um, you know, there's monitoring, the, the police do that kind of stuff, but kind of try to explore that avenue as well, just to keep the kids uh, nice to each other. Um, as far as safety goes, last year was um, a good year. For, we got a lot of safety grants that we utilized well, and that's a great start, but safety is nothing. Safety is something that you can never just, you're never done doing it. You never, okay, check, you know, check. It's gotta be ever evolving. So we started with the entryways in the primary school. 
and we will be doing the entry and office in an intermediate school. We have um, addressed monitoring issues, and those are being installed and taken care of. Um, I would also hope as a district, we get some more formal training for our educators, which um, I think some ALICE training might be a really good avenue to pursue. And then with the social emotional learning adoption coming up next year, I also see that as a really great avenue to address the psychological and emotional safety of students and what that means through interactions with one another, um, social media interactions, and what their responsibility is as digital citizens. Okay, this one is for you. Okay. What are your top three goals for the district over the next three years? Um, kind of goes back to the first question I answered. I think it is absolutely vital to make sure the transition of the incoming new principal is the right fit and it's smooth and through that transition we make sure communication is open between students, families, and staff and that if there's anything that needs to be addressed or any areas of opportunity or any questions or concerns people have, it's addressed right away and nothing is left um, to fester. And uh, again, I think we need to continue to focus on professional development of staff, because if we are not continuing to develop our staff, then we're not ensuring our students the best education, both academically and from an inclusionary lens. Um, and then finally, continuing to look for opportunities to utilize technology. Uh, I would just say just to keep all the uh, administration as well as all the teachers on um, top of their game, so keep on that professional development, uh, make sure that uh, they know what's going on, what's, what's good, what, what you know, new ideas that are coming through um, from the national level, maybe even international, because uh, now there's a lot of uh, fellow think of internet, you know, with the internet everyone's kind of attached to each other now. So uh, I would do that. Also make sure that the, the schools, you know, the facilities are all up to date. Uh, I want to make sure that, um, kind of going back to the security thing about how uh, that the, barrier, the physical barriers are up to par and that everything's working as it should. Um, and then also about budgets. So we want to make sure that uh, we can sustain what we have going on uh, for the years to come to keep up that great uh, reputation. For you, Andy. As a school board member, how do you balance the needs of the community versus the needs of the school? Uh, I think they kind of go. I think they go hand in hand. Uh, obviously, the school is going to want more that the community can give, and vice versa sometimes. So, as a member, I uh, would balance it by uh, just prioritizing. You know what's most important. Uh, at the time, short term and long term, uh, I strategically think about everything, uh, usually before I answer a test question especially, make sure I have the right answer, um, and uh, so I think I just keep doing that, make sure that the overall goal is, you know, we all keep the same vision, we all keep the, we all have that same vision in mind, and make sure that the steps that get there and keep continuing that vision are aligned. As a school board member, how do you balance the needs of the community versus the needs of the school? One of the, not one of, um, in my opinion, the fundamental job of the school board is to balance students, educators, families, and the community. And every decision that you make for any situation that comes before you um, or concern has to be viewed with that lens every time. And so the balancing act isn't always going to be equal, but as long as it's always coming from a student first focus and concern and what's for the greater good, the balance is always going to be equitable. Um, and that is what I think is fundamentally necessary um, from a school board member, and given the strategic plan that we've designed, along with 
community members and staff that everybody's bought into. Now when we're trying to maintain that balancing act, it has to be through the lens of our mission statement. It has to align with our values. It has to align with everything our community said they hold to. Next question is for you, Shane, first. As a board member, how do you support teaching, learning, and, and learning in the district? Um, I think I touched earlier on the Workforce Engagement Committee. That's really how I see the best way to support staff. Um, as far as the teaching and learning, last year we had, um, as a member of the Student Achievement Committee, I was also part of the math curriculum adoption and reviewing that and making sure that we picked the curriculum that was best for our students to grow them the most. Um, we've also been working on reading and writing curriculum and adoption, which is directly gonna impact teaching and learning. Um, and also, as a support to those things, TILT, how do we, again, take the standards, the technology standards for students and staff that we've adopted and now employ them with these new curriculums that we've rolled out. And how do we continue to support them and also follow through and make sure what we've rolled out and the curriculum that we've chosen and implemented is actually successful? And if it's not, what else do we need to do to support staff or students? Sure. As a board member, how do you support teaching and learning in the district? Uh, I think the main thing would be going back to that collaboration idea, uh, making sure that whoever wants and is able to do professional development courses or online or in-person trainings to make sure that they are attending and uh, if they want to go that they can, you know, that the school supports them, uh, the school board supports them. Uh, also just overall is making sure that they all have the tools for success because the, the youth are, are the future and so we want to make sure that they can teach the youth uh, to the best of their abilities and we want to make sure that we give them those tools to, to do so. Okay, thanks. So this is for you, Andrew, first. What five words would you use to describe yourself? And which one is the most important? Uh, I would use assume you're hyphen, family oriented, open minded, uh, passionate, dedicated, and flexible. Uh, the most important, I would say, would be uh, passionate. I think when you're passionate about something, uh, you've got your heart in it, and you really will do whatever it takes to see that thing, that project, that plan, that curriculum succeed. So I think when you're passionate about something, that's, that's the most important. Okay. Um, kind, caring, empathetic, curious, and patient. Um, it's really important to me to get to know each and every person and appreciate that experience with them, whether it's checking out groceries at the grocery store. Like, that's a 20 second interaction with a human being that needs to be honored and you have an opportunity to learn something and maybe to make someone stay better. And that's how I do every day. Okay, this one's for you first. What would you do to celebrate those teachers, staff, student, student members that exemplify the school's mission and vision statements? Hmm. Well, earlier this year, we had a surprise celebration for the staff, because um, they're exceptional. <laughs> um, and earlier this year, the whole school board and the administration and amazing volunteers from the PTO came and all the staff's rooms were sub, or they had a sub for an hour and a surprise. They were all put on buses. And we were met at Ironwood Golf Course, and they were treated to um, a district lunch. And they got to spend time with one another and talk to colleagues or 
primary friends got to talk with intermediate friends that they don't usually always get to see. And they were given the, it was truly a celebration, I think, in that it was a surprise. They didn't have to do any of their lesson plans. They didn't have to, just for that hour and a half, they got to just be, we're celebrating you just for the sake of being you, and we recognize all your efforts. Um, things like that, notes, letters. I never miss an opportunity to send an email to a staff and to, or a letter or a note, just saying thank you, thank you. My, my child came home today smiling because of this, or I was at the concert, or I was at this play. Your hard work is evident. And again, back to one of those like everyday being an opportunity, why, why do you get up? If, like, you risk nothing by saying thank you or valuing somebody or appreciating. So I think that's something to take advantage of as often and frequently as possible. Uh, I would, same kind of thing, throw a party. Uh, I think verbal and uh, written recognition is important. I think everyone enjoys a pat on the back every now and then, but for those top performers, uh, you know, I really enjoy meeting new people, and I think that they they would they should deserve. You know, they did a good job, and uh, they deserve to be recognized for whatever that time period was, the year, or the quarter, or the semester, or whatever it's going to be. Um, in our neighborhood, I organize a annual block party, and we get everyone together, and we just have a good time. Uh, you know, it's, it's all about that recognition, and I don't like it. <laughs> Can I, can I ask a question verbally, or is that? Yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> like, it's, too, it's too hard to write down. Right? That's why I'm like, question. this is hard. Like, or right, Sarah, 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 do you want to go first? No, go ahead. Okay. It's just like everyone's staring at me. This question will be for first. Okay. I just, just explain some background for my question. Is you know Every school has students with special needs, and those special needs can be learning disabilities, they can be emotional issues, you know, behavioral issues. And uh, my feeling, um, and, you know, based on some of my observations and interactions and that, is that we're many times in a reactive situation. Okay, we need to, when this happens, we have to pull the child out of the classroom or, you, you know what I'm saying? So. I guess what I would like to hear is, do you have any ideas on how we could be more proactive in helping these children during you know, the school time? Because they are here and this is going on in school. And also for the other students, who, who, so they could better support them and maybe better understand what's going on. So I'm looking for you know, any ideas on how we could be more, more proactive. I, I think uh, open lines of communication and just making sure that everyone involved has proper training to deal with the situation. Um, that would be more reactive, of course, but it's hard to be proactive. Um, it depends on what the, the issue or the event is going on. Uh, but I, I, again, I guess maybe uh, more training just to make sure that they recognize these triggers. If there's, you know, if it's a if it's something that triggers issues or if it's a kid that acts out, making sure, recognizing these trends and, and watching, going back to efficiencies, you know, watching for inefficiencies and making sure that uh, these tr triggers are handled or not occurring or if they are, um, maybe not being so as reactive, but maybe, you know, being able to recognize it earlier, still reactive but not, you know, everyone has a process and everyone has their tasks so everyone knows what to do should something happen. Um, you can sometimes make the whole process more efficient, meaning the overall thing is not as severe. So when it comes to inclusion and um, academic approach in general, you're trying to push this universal design for learners, meaning that everything should be planned every day so the learning has objectives and it is proactive. Because often in education, you teach something, take a test, and then what the student does, you find out what they know or what they didn't know based on their score, but you're already on to something else. I think that same mindset has to be applied to behavior, and that same universal design for learners has to be applied to behavior. 
Um, and that needs to be done in collaboration with the support staff and with special ed. And I think there needs to be time built into the schedule for the support staff, gen ed teachers, and special ed teachers to truly collaborate and really, really adopt and embrace what does it truly mean to be proactive. We're all professionals and we're all coming from this different lens and may know student or students differently. We need to collaborate to get together to, before the triggers happen, identify them, eliminate them. And also do that being mindful of the rest of the students in the room. So when you do, when you universally design for learning, you're designing for already every student in the room, so you're not responding to an event, and you're not responding to just one child where you're then isolating that student again, and that student is being removed or it's compounding on the effect of their behaviors. And I think that is the be that in collaboration is the best way to keep going forward. So instead of just using this theory in pockets, I think we need to adopt it district-wide. You ready? I actually had one that flows perfectly into Kathy's question. Okay. It was, what are your thoughts on teacher collaboration and do you feel it should be mandated and or allotted time throughout the given day? Either it's at the start of the school day, at the end of the school day. From my experience, I've only been here two years, but mm -hmm. um, the faculty that I've spoken to, there is little to no collaboration, even among their own teams of like 5K teachers not collaborating together, okay. let alone like the 4K and 5K teachers also collaborating. You know, like what do they need to work on? You know, if you're not advising with your peers above and below you, I don't feel like we're really doing it justice. So I, I'd be interested to hear your perspective of that. Yes, collaboration is vital. We never want um, a student to come out of a classroom and you meet that student a year later and you can say, oh, you must have had teacher so-and-so. That is not the education that we're standing behind. That's not what we're here to deliver. That's not delivering equity. So yes, in order to deliver equity, truly, you, teachers have to collaborate. So the idea is through a lot of the student achievement meetings that I've been in when it comes to um, math, tilt, and ELA is that per grade level, the teachers are identifying what they want their um, essential outcomes to be and what they want their teaching points to be. We expect every teacher to have a different style, and we don't want people to be to teach as robots because that's where like the science and the craft of teaching need to fit. But yes, I absolutely agree that they need time to collaborate with each other. So that's a strong unified fund, and also have time to learn best practice points from each other. Because maybe one teacher is, you know, doing a phenomenal job at, at this area, and their 5K teacher mates could could learn. Um, but yes, there also needs to be up and down, because what are you teaching to if you can't identify all of the outcomes or teaching points that are expected of the child going into the next grade? Uh, I think it would, it would be a good thing. I think up and inter as well as intra, uh, up and down, left and right, make sure that everyone's on the same page. Uh, I think it could also be looked at as part of the professional development. You know, if uh, 4K are collaborating with 5K and first grade, you know, they can help prepare, they can help write their lesson plans more effectively uh, to prepare the kids for those future grades. Um, I think right now they do a good job, but uh, you know, there's always areas for improvement with everything in life. So, um, but overall, I think the collaboration is good. Uh, I think that it also could, um, could make things more unified. Um, you obviously want that personal touch on things, but you want to make sure that all the kids are getting um, at least a, you know the same level plus some. So, by collaborating, we can make sure that the teachers are all. Uh, you know, hey, I did this with my kids. Oh, I'm going to do that. You know, I'm going to do that too. But I'm going to put my spin on it. And then, oh, I'm going to steal your idea. And I'm going to do that too and put my spin on it. Um, so yeah, I think collaboration is good. Any other questions from the audience? Another one. Uh, this is on community service. Why do you want to give up time with your family to come to school to the school board meetings? Uh, I want to give up time uh, because 
my kids are very young, they're just starting in this district, and with that, I'm very dedicated and passionate to make sure to see the district continue to succeed and, uh, you know, up higher even. Uh, I want to make sure that not only my kids, but everyone's kids are receiving the best education. Uh, as I said, I purposely moved to this, to this area, to this community for this school district. Um, and that time with your family is priceless, you can never get it back, but at the same time, uh, they are our future. So we want to make sure that they are getting a good education, um, so we want to make sure that the district succeeds. Honestly, I never want to give up time with my family, but I look at the value of doing this in the school board and the meetings and what that means ultimately to my children and not only my children, but everybody's children. So when I make decisions or have ideas or if we're in meetings having conversations, it's never from the lens of just my family. I'm representing every, everyone's family, everyone's children. Um, what makes it worth it though, and what three years ago really got me motivated to run in the first place is that they're no longer with you. Like, they're spending more waking hours with another adult <laughs> than you. And where can I now have a positive impact um, on those adults that are now supporting my children? Where can I best support them? And I felt the school board was the best way that I could support the people supporting my children and everybody's children. This is uh, for you first, Kim. Uh, with Tony Hubert as governor now, how do you think that's going to change our district? Um, well, his earliest proposed budget shows a lot more money coming in, but we have a divided government, so he can propose a lot of budgets, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to pass. Um, so am I, I'm cautiously optimistic more dollars will come to education, but having to go through a Republican Congress, we don't necessarily see a lot of people on both sides standing up unified right now, getting behind something, saying we're going to do it. So I don't want to be pessimistic and say, more focus won't be on education, but a realistic look right now. Wait and see. I wish I knew more. I wish I had a crystal ball. <laughs> Any same question? Um, I'm optimistically a realist, so I want to make sure that he actually achieves what he says he's going to do. Um, I, I, uh, I, I think we should continue to plan, assuming nothing's going to change, and then if things change, awesome, and you know, then we can celebrate and and then plan for the next period. Um, but you never really know until things do change. Um, people tend to be big talkers and not a lot of doers, so uh, we'll, see what, we'll see what he can do. Uh, this next one's for you, Pam. If there were students in this room right now, how would you speak to them? I would uh, speak to them like adults, or well, not adults, but like kids. I mean, their kids, their minds are expanding. They're they're you know still growing. They're still maturing. They're they you know I can't. I'm not gonna. It's uh, a hard question. Uh, how about as a school board member? How would you speak to them? I would speak. It depends on the topic. I would speak to them uh, just like any other kid. Um, I don't. I wouldn't consider myself as this high up individual, I, I, would, I would speak to them like I would be them at Pick and Save or, or something. I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at them as, as, you know, as being above them or being their parent or, you know, I'd look for them for feedback, you know, how are things going? Uh, you know, obviously the, they have their own personal opinions on how things are going, you know, so you take it with a grain of salt, but, you know, you speak to them like they're human beings, which they are. Um, I would hope in my day-to-day -day interactions with people, you can't tell whether I'm talking to a four-year-old or I'm talking to a neighbor or I'm talking to the bus driver. I interact and interact with, speak with, communicate with 
everybody the same, regardless of age. I want to learn something about everybody, and I think children are fascinating, so I would approach them the same way I approach um, anybody. And I think, I always tell my kids this, God gave you two ears and one mouth, because you're supposed to listen twice as much as you speak. And so any opportunity to listen to people is an opportunity worth taking. Any other questions from the audience? I can't think of any more. Yes. I have one more. How will you set aside your own personal beliefs and desires to achieve the goal or outcome that benefits the community and students as a whole? And follow up, how will you engage or include the parents in the community to be more involved in the decision making process? So for example, I'm newer to the community, mm -hmm. I'm very um, curious myself, I want to participate as much as possible, I don't feel like I have a voice in a lot of topics. How can you set, set my mind at ease? You know, how do you engage me? <laughs> um, yes. Okay. Um, and I think, Sarah, we've talked a little bit about this. Um, I think there needs to be an opportunity or time set aside, maybe, not maybe, but set aside for the community, families, staff, whomever, to interact with the board that isn't necessarily a formal board setting. Because I, a lot of our, our community is incredibly involved and interested, but not everybody's super comfortable coming to a more formal board meeting where you have to sign in. There's only a certain time that you can get up and speak. It's recorded. Um, what kind of learning opportunity does that give you if you have something to say, but then it can't be a respondable conversation? Um, so I think it would be, at the beginning of the school year, I would see a great opportunity to have a meeting like that, if not quarterly, and not doing having a meeting that's specific to a topic just when a topic arises. Because um, then, then we are not balanced in operating with the community. The whole idea of a smaller town and a smaller community is to be able to function together. And so, um, I would take responsibility, absolutely, as a board member to identify ways to have more comfortable, informal settings where we can do that, where everybody would feel comfortable coming out and speaking. I, I think the district is awesome at uh, electronic communication, making sure the word gets out, making sure that everyone knows of snow days, of whether the kids are meeting outside or going to recess this day or not. Uh, but besides that, I think it's also important to get that face-to-face -face time. I think um, in this day and age, the, the human interaction is kind of getting lost. Uh, so with that, I would, I would make sure that new and existing community members, you know, they come to open houses, they come to the board meetings, they come to uh, open forums, you know, make sure that they get, they get involved as much as they are, feel, or as much as they want to. Um, you obviously can't force people to, to do things, but should they want to get involved, it should be very easy for them to. Um, if they want to stay in the loop, uh, obviously the, the communication lines, just keep those open. Um, everyone's got a cell phone now, you know, texting, calling, emails, everyone everyone gets that stuff now. So that's that's easy and no, and no brainer. Sarah, that was like, that was part two. Yeah, I started talking about this much, which I wrote down your comments about the years and miles. I'm going to take that to heart. <laughs> Listen more, talk less. <laughs> um, That's my kids to myself. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you want to revisit your first? Because I thought both were. Yeah, so the first one was how would you set aside your own personal beliefs and desires okay. for the betterment of the community? Everyone has their own opinions, and I think it's important that we do put them aside. And it's all about that collaboration. Uh, we're talking about how it's Democrats and Republicans right now. I mean, everyone, you know, we all have to come to agreement on things. So my personal beliefs might not align with your personal beliefs, but we both have to make sure that we see the end vision, the end goal, and that the steps along the way are, are, are towards that goal. Um, and maybe, and that's, that's how I would do it. I'll just make sure that we, you know, we all have the same goal. We all want the best for our kids, 
best for my kids, best for your kids. We all want the district to do good, uh, do well. So, you know, just the steps along to get there, maybe, you know, I would think we should do it this way, you think we should do it that way, but that's why it would be important for the community to be involved so that those voices could be heard. Um, it goes back to the balancing act and every decision. I recognize this is an elected position and I am representing the people that voted for me and then ultimately this community and the families in it. So my decisions and voice are rooted in my beliefs, but that doesn't drive it because I know it, it's not just my voice. It's constantly still trying to balance students, staff, families, and communities. And what is the ultimate decision that has the greatest positive impact on all four of those? And I think it also does not hurt to solicit community feedback. If you're, if you're in a situation where, yeah, I mean, it, if you're being charged to make a decision and there's five board members and everybody can see benefits to both sides, then yeah, there needs to be more feedback and larger discussions need to be had with more people. I have a follow-up question to, to something you guys addressed earlier. It was about, you, you t talked about uh, the, the budget that Tony Evers had proposed and it may not get through. Mm -hmm. If we end up getting more money from the state, do you foresee a reduction in property taxes or do you view that as, okay, let's keep the taxes the same, we have this windfall and let's spend it? Um, in the last three years, if you look on your tax bill, the school line item relative to that, taxes have declined over 20% as long as your home value assessment is state static. For us to be getting money back from the state or part of his budget being proposed and not being on finance, some run or fill, um, the direct impact, it wouldn't, there isn't a necessarily cause or effect there. Sorry, Kristen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there isn't an exact cause or effect because we've been operating at a neutral budget. So to have all this money come in, does that go right to Fund 10, which is then, or how does that work? Well, there's, there's kind of two pieces to the budget, right? There's a revenue limit, which is, for any given school district, what the most amount of money that you can spend effectively, right? And then there is which was set in 1993. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then the second part of it is of that revenue limit, how much of it comes from the state and how much of it comes from local property taxes. Um, so our revenue limit has been static. Well, was set in you know 93 or whatever it was um, so part of the proposed budget was increasing the lower limit of that revenue limit so we our school district was very financially responsible in 1993 and so the amount of money we spent per student was small compared to many of the other schools in the area um, and so we've been living that for the last I don't know how many years it is now, 16 years or something. 26. Uh, what? 26. 26. 26. Oh, not enough decimal places. Uh, so one of the parts of the budget was increasing that level, or that, that lower limit to every school district gets at least this much per student in their revenue that they that they collect. Wait, again, I can, we can. And then, yeah, the other part of how much shot by it where the money comes from, state versus yeah. local, you know, the special ed spending versus you know our increase in property values and all that kind of comes into play. It's, it's not like very cut and dry. I wish I could give you a very succinct answer. <laughs> the question is, um, you know, we talked we talked about um, the student and and wanting to do things for the student. The taxpayer is also important, right? We, Absolutely. People want to live here because they like low taxes. Mm -hmm. so, and so there's that balancing act. You've heard a lot about what the students want and what's good for the community. 
and it's critical, but also the taxpayer. And so I just want to, I mean, I guess I'm trying to see if there's ways that you see that we can actually cut budgets. Or if we get more for the state, can we cut back on the taxpayer work? I think any of those are an option. I also think the number one thing that drives home value is a high achieving school. So I never want to lose sight of that because then ultimately you are losing money then. Right. Am I in any way saying that I expect more from a homeowner or homeowner from taxes or monetarily? No. Do I think taxes should be increased? Absolutely not. Every decision I've supported has been for the betterment of families, students, but it's all coming from a very fiscally conservative lens. And we've been able to utilize the dollars we have and the budget we have and the staff we have to keep growing, but it's not necessarily always through spending money. And But to your one part, because I want to make sure, I don't by no means want to be elusive, I don't know the answer to your question of if more money came in, how would that be distributed? And could that ultimately be distributed back to the taxpayer? That's something, am I understanding yeah. that? Yeah. yeah, I truly don't know the answer to that, but I'd be more than happy to look into it. Okay, would you like to <laughs> Sure, phone a friend. Um, <laughs> I, was like, I, uh, <laughs> I think I have to blend. I always go back to your question about the personal beliefs. Obviously, the taxpayer, I want it, you know, I want it back in my pocket. But at the same point, we want a high achieving school. We want the district to be, you know, I think it has to be a blend. You would have to do a little bit of a little bit of here, a little bit of there, type of thing. Um, we try to make. I would off the, off the cuff, I would say that you know we'd have to try and keep the budget roughly the same. Depending, I don't know what the difference, you know, the difference is going to be. So you know, we'd share it. You'd have you'd have to share it. That's that long story short. Yeah. Can you just throw something? Yeah. Go ahead, Dean. Okay. Okay. No, to me, yeah. as a school board, have never believed that you actually have to tie a lot of dollars you spend to be a high achieving school. It's how you spend the dollars you get. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's been proof in this district that you can have a very high quality school and be very protective of the taxpayer dollars. Um, the budget, uh, the dollars that would come in if we got the 200 and the 204 in the next biennium would be very helpful because of us being a declining enrollment. Every uh, year, the amount of state aid coming back to us declines. So every budget that we've done in the last quite a few years has dropped, and it's not by just a couple of hundred dollars, it's a couple hundred thousand to four hundred thousand. Every year our budget drops, and the local taxpayers are always taking on their portion. But we have a mindset that we will make do with what we have and we will do the very best to provide a, a very high quality education for our children because we are focused on what we're doing as for kids. And um, it's, been, it's been a great ride in this school district, seeing good things that happen. Thanks, Dean, for the extra card. Any other questions from the audience? If not, then we'll go to closing statements. Uh, Andy, you're up first. All right, I'll keep it brief. I talk real fast, I know. Uh, I'm open-minded, I'm passionate. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd be fresh eyes. I'm very business acumen uh, cultured. I'm very dedicated to seeing the district succeed, seeing all the schools succeed, seeing the teachers succeed. Uh, I like the hometown feel. We love it here, and uh, I just want to keep doing that academic excellence. As, as Dean said, it's not what you spend it on or how much you spend it on, but it's it's, it's how you spend it and it's, it's where you spend it. Well, um, thank you to everyone that came, and also a thank you for uh, the last three years of entrusting me to serve as your school board member. 
It has been truly an honor um, and a great opportunity. And I think we've started um, working on some really great things. And I think there's just room to keep growing. In particular, I would like to keep working on workforce engagement, individualized learning, um, all for a very conservative lens. <laughs> But those things are all very, very important to me, and I would be um, very grateful to earn your vote and to continue doing that work for the next three years. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, a couple things just to kind of follow up. And you know, just to, to kind of get into some of the budget and just some of the other questions that, that kind of came up. Um, you know, the budget is a big deal this year. And actually, Dean, myself, and Jennifer Newman were just in Madison today talking to state legislators and getting kind of the lowdown. The new money is being proposed as a combination of freeing up what we would call general fund dollars. For instance, you're going to hear a lot about special education. And whether they increase reimbursement for special education, um, right now it's right around 25%. They're talking about raising it 30 then to 60%. So right now our transfer into special education is right around $800,000 and that's reimbursed at 25%. So if they bump it up to 60%, that will free up approximately $300,000 that we can use into Fund 10, okay? That right there, that proposal is the only proposal that is basically bringing more state aid into the revenue limit. Any other additional dollars Will be, will be on the property taxpayer, is the way they're, they're talking about that. So, um, still more to come. We're not quite sure what's going to happen. At the end of the day, if we can't get along in Madison, the, the Assembly and the Senate do not agree with what Governor Evers said. We stay with Governor Walker's budget from a year ago. No new monies go in. We stay status quo with our funding. And that is a very real situation. And we are planning for that. We are planning for that. Um, but obviously, in the past, we have under levy. Up until 2015, we did under levy. We did not access all the dollars that were available in the revenue limit. So um, we have demonstrated that we will only use what it is that we need. And to Dean's point right now, we are preparing for about a $450,000 deficit, where our spending level from this year needs to be reduced approximately $450,000. Now, we're really lucky, we've got a strong fund balance. We have about $1.5 million in facility funds only. So we're ready for that, and we're really tackling those and really taking a look at how do we utilize all of our dollars from that budgetary lens. But uh, again, fiscally, very, very strong, and prepared to weather the future, and as we're seeing more development, more students come in, how do we level off within the revenue limit and within our pupil count as well. Um, Phil did mention that there is a conversation about how do we raise the per pupil spending across the state to be equal. Because right now, up until last year when we were told we had to raise our per pupil limit, we were the lowest per pupil spending school in Waukesha County. Which means no one had, little, had less dollars to use to educate kids than we did across the county. And we were, were in the top three across an achievement lens. So um, very, very critical that we continue to leverage the opportunities to make sure that we are fiscally sound to moving into the future too as well. Um, safety is another big thing that continued to come up. Um, outside of the Department of Justice grants that Katie, that Katie we, uh, uh, commented on, um, we spent probably another twenty-five dollars to $30,000 over and above those, making sure that our schools are safe. Uh, and we continue to take a look at that work with law enforcement as well as outside agencies to make sure everything is really, really good there. Um, from a collaboration lens, Sarah, this is a really, really good question. One of the things that we get hit up on is, is we mandate too much collaboration with our staff because they're given five prep periods a, a week. Um, we require each team to be meeting two times a week, one in the focus of literacy and the other one in the focus of mathematics. And this past year, when we did some staffing shifts, we took one teacher if you think of like uh, third grade, you took a second grade teacher, moved them up to third, and took a fourth grade teacher and moved them down to third too. So we try that, that collaboration to make sure that we know that vertical alignment through the district is, is consistently there too as well. So 
Um, we'd love to share more about what, what we do to really encourage collaboration, but also have that balance of personal need for the teacher because we know that they've got to prepare for 18 to 20 kids or some of our intermediate level teachers are right around that 80 uh, to 100 level too. So um, lots of different things and we can talk all day about all the great things we're doing for schools here and uh, for all of our students. So um, and again, we can talk special ed, we can talk budget, whatever you'd like. Uh, we certainly can. So it's a lot of fun. So Andy, Kate, thank you very, very much. And uh, good luck to both of you. April 3rd, get out and vote. So thank you.